welcome to everyone tuning in over Facebook, and uh, we want to welcome you guys with us tonight. Everyone here, welcome. Let's get up there we are, and let's get ready to praise the Lord, and let's just open in prayer. Yes, Lord, we want to thank you, Jesus, for tonight. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. May you be glorified, Jesus, in everything that we do tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's make ready. i 
So I shout. So I shout out your name from the rooftops. I proclaim that I am yours. I am yours. All that I am, I place into your. And I am yours, I am yours. Thank you, Lord, we come and lay down our, our lives at your feet tonight. We pray that your kingdom will come and your will be done here tonight. Yes, Jesus. Be glorified, Jesus. Yes. Desperate for you, yeah. I'm desperate for you. So I Mercy and grace unfolds hunger and thirst. More of you, Jesus, hunger and thirst. With arms stretched wide, I know you hear my cry. Speak to me now. Speak to me now, and I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you more, I want to know you more, I surrender.
passion when Jesus breathed within us. Lord, I have your way. Lord, I have your way in me. Like a mighty storm, so Lord, thank you that we can come and surrender, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross so that we can come and we can approach you with confidence, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. Thank you for, for being with us. Thank you for drawing near to us, Lord. Thank you that you never leave us, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Right, you guys can have your seats. Thanks, guys. I was anointed. All right. So thanks to everyone coming this evening. Are there to the people watching us on Facebook? I'm really excited to share with you guys tonight. Um, I didn't know the set list for the worship this evening, and my sermon is firstly quite in line with the second song, and also it follows a bit on Tian's service this morning. All right, before I start, let's quickly pray. Yes, Lord, thank you that we can be here this evening. Thank you for keeping us safe, Lord. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for guiding us, Lord. Father God, I would just pray this evening that we can come and you can just open our hearts, that your spirit can just minister to us, and that your will be done this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so for this evening, I'm going to be looking at a few chapters in Exodus. We're going to be looking at how God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, and then we're going to look at a few of the miracles that happened there, and then I'm going to tie it up with what happens in John and what John teaches regarding what we see in Exodus. So my chapters for this evening, if you're taking notes, we're going to be looking from Exodus chapter 14 to, to chapter 17. 
And if I have to give my, my sermon a, a title, I would just plainly say to be in the middle. All right. We're in the middle between two places. We don't know if we should go left. We don't know if we should go right. We are plainly in the middle. So looking through these chapters in Exodus, God delivers the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt. And at that time in the world, Egypt was the greatest power, the greatest city in the world. They had the most money. They had the most military power. And then, and then God's there, and he delivers them from Egypt. All right? And it's not, it's not the Israelites who deliver themselves. It is only God who delivers, who delivers them from Egypt. Okay. So Israel doesn't raise up itself and conquer Egypt. No, God conquers Egypt and leads them out. And then I find a lot of things similar to in, in, in our lives, in my life personally. We like the Israelites. God frees us maybe from slavery or from our Egypt. And as soon as we're out of, out of Egypt, we begin to moan and we begin to grumble against God. And we see that once, once they see these miracles and they see God bringing water from a rock and, and opening up the sea, the Red Sea, for them to go through, right straight after that, they begin to moan and grumble. But God meets their moaning with blessing and he cares for them. So firstly, he puts men on the ground and he provides water from a rock and he constantly cares for them throughout their mumbling. Right, so if I had to give an outline for this evening service, if I have to give an outline, I would have three points. My first point would be God pursues and provides. Secondly, it was the work of God himself that propelled the Israelites toward the promised land, and we're going to finish up with approaching God. So my first point is God pursues and provides. We see that throughout Exodus, God continues to provide for Israel. And, and he promised them, prom promises them an escape from Egypt. Okay, and if we look in chapter 13, I'm not going to read too much into it now, but maybe in this week you can read through these chapters. If we look at Exodus chapter 13, we see that they're in the wilderness and God begins to lead them. He comes in the form of a pillar of a cloud in the day and he leads them and in the night is fire. And, and, and in, this, in this sense, in this passage, the fire means that God provides, that he's with them. And so he leads them through the wilderness. And in chapter 14, the Israelites come to the Red Sea. They see the Egyptians coming towards them, and they're afraid. And we see that God says in, 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 this, in this chapter that he didn't take the Israelites to the Egyptian, Egyptian country. No, he took them uh, along a longer route because he knew. And it says, God, God said that if they face war, they might change their mind and head back to Egypt. And I think Tian shared this morning on, on what, what fear does in our lives and the role of fear that it plays. And so immediately God is, God is, God is telling Moses, right, as soon as these Israelites, they, they face war, they're going to change their mind. So he goes out in front of them. And I'm going to read out of chapter 14, verse 10 to 16. It says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. In chapter 13, it goes on to say, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, will, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Amen. So it jumps out to me here. It says, so do not be afraid. Do not fear. It says, do not, it says, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. And it says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And what stands out to me in, in these passages, I'm quickly going to go on. In verse 15, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, why, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So now we can see that God is walking in front of the, he's leading and, and he's guiding the Israelites. 
But what we can see, it's all about, it's all about God's glory. It's about God getting the glory. It's all about, it's about Him. It's about His people seeing His glory. It's about His people seeing His provision for them. And so I think so many times, or before I go on, I think we see in this chapter, they go through the Red Sea. They have just witnessed this amazing miracle. And then straight after chapter, chapter 14, they go into chapter 15, and all these Israelites come together with Moses, and they sing a victory song to Jesus, all right? And they sing a victory song to God for his deliverance. And straight in verse 16, it begins off, and it says, they mumbled against God. So they've witnessed all these things, and things you can't imagine. Imagine seeing the sea split, and they just witnessed this miracle and God providing for them. And right after that, they do sometimes what we do, and we, and we quarrel against God, or we mumble, or, or, we, or we, we turn negative. And I think with our relationship with Jesus, maybe it's only me, but it seems to be a cycle. All right, we reach the top of the cycle, and what happens is, all right, my, fire, my relationship with Jesus is on fire. Um, I'm living according to the Spirit, and I'm on fire, and things are going my way. And then all of a sudden, things begin to cool down, and then we're in the middle. We're not on fire, but we're also not as cold. We're just in the middle. We're going on, we're going on, we're going on. And maybe this is me. And in this, in this cycle, we certainly see, we see highs and we see lows. And I think they've got this high of seeing these miracles, and all of a sudden, there's this low where, they, where they're mumbling against God. And so all this grumbling and groaning against Moses and God, in Exodus 16, it says, God provided them with manna and quail. And in verse 17, it says, they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. All right, so firstly, we see a lack of faith from the Israelites, but yet God still provides for them. He pr still provides for men and quail. And that is what we see in our life. It is the goodness of God that continually blesses us, no matter what we've done, but it's just the goodness of God and his love for us, which he contin continues to bless us. And so no matter the lack of faith, God still provided for them. I want to move on. I still want the bands to come up a bit later. So I'm going to go forward a bit. My second point is, it was the work of God that propelled them towards the promised land for his glory. So the motive behind all these miracles was not only for the Israelites. It was for God, for his people to see his glory. When, when I, when I um, preached a few weeks ago, I spoke about true wisdom and false wisdom and how it is not about us and, and it's about God, that God is for God and we are living for God, and it's not all about us. So he wanted these people to see his glory. And then when, when, we, when we look further, you see God's goodness in the, in the life of the Israelites in the desert, and even still in our lives today, his goodness isn't motivated by our, righteous, our righteousness or what, what we have done. No, that his strength is through his action towards us people, all right, whom he knew we would be unfaithful to the covenant promises. Okay. So God blesses these Israelites, even though he knows that they're going to stumble, even though he knows they're going to fail. He blesses them, even though he knows they will be unfaithful. And we see this throughout the Bible, throughout the scripture, God continues to act on behalf of his people. And ultimately, we see him, we see him send his, his son, Jesus, to actually die and to raise up again. So he continually works on our behalf. I'm going to jump a bit forward in John 6, when I know Dion shared this last week as well. In John 6, we see the miracle of, of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And I'm going to read to you from verse 47. It says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, the Israelites, ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So all of a sudden, we look, in, we look at the Israelites, and we see they're in, a, they're in an exodus. And now we see in John 6, and when Jesus is there, he offers them the opportunity to participate in a more spiritual exodus. And, and what he says, he wants us to eat more than just the physical bread, more than just the temporary manna that came down. But know that we must trust in him so that we may live and eat forever. And the question I asked myself this week are we, are we focusing, are we feeding ourselves on the temporary, on the things of this world, or are we feeding ourselves on, on Jesus, the bread of life, the one who lives in the one in whom we live? Are we feeding ourselves both ways? If we're stuck in the middle, are we looking towards the temporary, or are we focusing on Jesus? 
And I think sometimes when we're stuck in this middle, right, we get to a point where we plainly just live to exist. And we say, we're going to see later on in John, it says, Jesus is life. And, and when we're in the life, we begin to live and we know, don't just only exist. So I'm going to take it further. So those who know God, and before I go on, this week I was, I was really convicted. I'm like, Yo, I know the scripture about Jesus, the bread of life, and I know the scripture that he is the living water. Um, but I was just convicted once again that it, it is not only just about knowing the scriptures. It is about knowing the God of the scriptures. It's about knowing Jesus personally within the scriptures. Because just no, plainly knowing the scriptures, right, we're not going to grow in a relationship. We've got to know the God of the scriptures, of the Bible. So God's provision is sufficient to meet the needs of all those who by faith feast on him. Amen. So when we look forward in, in Exodus 17, Moses struck the rock. Okay, and we're going to see the correlation between Exodus 17 and, and in John. So what happens in John 4, verse 13 to 14, it says, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, I will give them, the water I will give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And I know we've read these scriptures, and I know we've known these scriptures, but I really hope that the Spirit will, will just talk to you in your heart and just give you a fresh revelation of these scriptures. So what we can see is the first rock in Exodus 17. Moses struck the rock, and the water came out of the rock. All right, and God sent Jesus, who was the second rock, to die on the cross so that we can have the everlasting life. We can have the everlasting water. And then we see how actually the Old Testament is fulfilled here, because we see the first rock which was a temporary, the water was struck and the Israelites got water. And secondly, Jesus, the second rock, was, was, we died on the cross so that he could fulfill our spiritual needs so that we can have a relationship. And this relationship Jesus wants for us through the cross is a personal relationship. And it is a relationship which, which he wants for you. He is coming towards you. And I think that last song also said it so nicely. So we as Christians need to recognize our thirst. If we are stuck in the middle are we hungry and thirsty for things from the world? All right. Are we hungry and thirsty for temporary things? Or we are hungry and thirsty for the word of God and for Jesus so that we can actually we can actually grow and that we can our thirst can be satisfied. And I think so often when we're stuck in the middle of we, I don't know if I want a temporary or or um on, on Jesus and the bread of life, we become to find ourselves in the middle. And so often we find ourselves in the middle, and it's quite a dangerous place where our Christianity and our worship will become boring. Um, so what, what I mean by it's going to become boring is we're just doing it because we're doing it. We're doing it because we think it's the right thing to do. And this is dangerous, first of all. But second of all, it's not how it should be. We are in there to have a, a living relationship, and our acts and our deeds are coming out of our love for Jesus and out of God's love for us that we can do the good deeds. And it is not just about being in the middle and not knowing where we want to go. I mean, so not only this, but the Spirit of God will fill you with streams of living water to quench your thirst forever. Okay, so now we know our first point and our second point. And, and, and lastly, what I want to touch on is that, that we can approach God. And because of Jesus coming and dying on the cross, that we can approach Him with confidence. In Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 22, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, verse 22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So through, the, through, through Jesus dying and through the blood that was bled that we can know, we can, we can confidently come to Jesus. It's not like we've got to do these certain things to be in relationship with Jesus. It is no, we just, we just come to him because of the work of Jesus. And that is what the gospel is. It is when, when we make a mistake or we constantly fumble, God still moves near to us. And what I mean by this is in Matthew 28, I know we all know the scriptures, um, but I'm just going to read it to you again. I'm only going to go from verse 16 to 18. It says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, 
to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. All right? So when they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. Okay, so now we can see all of a sudden these disciples who have witnessed, like the Israelites, they've witnessed all these miracles and they've seen all these things. All of a sudden, they are worshiping, they're worshiping God through all these miracles, but at this point, they're also doubting. And I think so many times in our lives, we're also doubting certain things. We may be stuck in the middle and we don't know what's happening next, and we're doubting the goodness of God and we don't know what's coming next, or we don't know what to do, or we don't know where to go. But then it says, even though they doubted, what does it say? It says, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? So in, in their doubting and in their not knowing and in their worshiping, yet still doubting, it was Jesus who went to them. And that is the gospel. When we are doubting, we're not supposed to move away from Jesus and we are, because we're unsure. No, Jesus comes to us even in our doubt. Amen. Okay. So disciples have witnessed these miracles, but they doubted. And all of a sudden, when the disciples doubted, Jesus didn't say, oh, I regret picking these 12, or I regret telling you to follow me. He didn't go out there and look for 12 new disciples. No, he went towards them, and he shared with them. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so I want you to know, even if there's doubt, you know, that God comes towards you. He always draws near us. And what we see in, in Hebrews, it says, we need to draw near to him. In John 1, John 1 verse 4 and 5, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. All right? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay. So we read earlier that Jesus is the bread of life. So if we're living for the temporary, and we're stuck on the temporary, and we're just going on day by day, and we're stuck on the temporary, what happens is we begin to just exist. All right? We begin to exist. We begin to do our are things as we are as we are going on, but it says in him, in Jesus was life, and that life is the light for all mankind. So to to choose Jesus and to wholeheartedly surrender to him, we are living in the life of Christ. We are living with Jesus. And when we're living with Jesus, we can be satisfied and our hunger and thirst will be filled. And we know that the devil says he comes to kill and destroy. But we know that Jesus comes so that we can have life and live it in abundance. And that we can have a life which is full. And that's the big thing. When we're living for the temporary, we are so focused on the temporary and then we are just living to exist instead of focusing on the eternal and realizing we are here to have life and have life in Christ and have life to the abundance because that is the goodness of God and that is what he wants for us. Amen. So I'm going to ask JP to come up and while he just plays for me, I'm going to, I'm just going to go a bit further. It says that so often, maybe I'm just preaching to myself tonight, is sometimes maybe I have the wrong mindset, and maybe you do too this evening, we realize that, right, I'm not perfect, I constantly make mistakes, I'm not perfect, and we feel that God is disappointed, all right? So maybe that's just me, and, but it's not like that. We can't have the mindset of realizing every mistake I make, no, God is disappointed, no, he knows you and he moves towards us. Even these disciples who saw the miracles, even they doubted while they were worshiping. So even in our doubt, we know that God draws near to us and we can draw near to him and have life in abundance. And I think this is the gospel. My last verse is in Galatians 2, verse 19 to 21. It says, For through the law, this is Paul writing, it says, For through the law I died, but Jesus. I died to the law so that I may live for God. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who have loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And before I end off, I wanna just touch on, on my last topic and maybe in the middle of my sermon, I haven't actually explained what it's about, but I, I believe it's going gonna, it's gonna to come through now, and I'm going to explain what I mean by in the middle. Okay. So to be a disciple and a, and a follower of Christ and to be a Christian is a lifelong process. It is a lifelong process. Of, of, of these two things I want to emphasize on, it is a process where we unconditionally surrender 
and secondly, obedience. And when I mean, what I mean by to unconditionally surrender, it is not partially surrendering, partially surrendering or being like, all right, I'm going to surrender, but I'm not going to surrender this part of my life. And that is, that is when we, that is the two things when I mean I'm saying I'm partially surrendering and I'm unconditionally surrendering myself to Jesus. And so often we feel, we feel these two things and we're like, ah, I want to surrender everything to Jesus, but I feel like I'm going to lose something. And then we're stuck in the middle. And to be a Christian, like I said, it's a lifelong process. And to surrender to our own conditions is not what Christianity is about. So like I mentioned, we've got our, when we half-heartedly surrender, or we don't give everything over. And on the other side, it is the command, it is what God expects from us, is to unconditionally surrender to Him. And, and what I mean by this is so often when we, when we get to the half, like the Israelites, when they half-heartedly surrendered, what happens is we begin to take matters into our own hands. If we are partially surrendering our hearts and we're keeping a few things for ourselves, what happens then we begin to take those matters into our own hands. And, and maybe it's me, but I've, what I've noticed is when we're in the middle of these two different types of surrender, in the middle we often find pain and we often find regret because we are doing it through our own hands. And so often when we try and do everything through our own hands, that is when we're going to fall short. That is when, when we're going to stumble because we know we are living then in the temporary, but Jesus says, I am the bread of life. All right, come to me and, and come, live, come live in me. And, and this is what happens when, when we don't take it, not in our own hands, but if we unconditionally surrender, when we walk the way of Jesus, it means by fully resting in Him and in His ability to fight on our behalf and win the battles of His people. Okay, and we're going to see that in John 14. So what I'm saying is when we rest on Christ, when we unconditionally surrender ourselves to Jesus, we are walking the way God intends, and that means that we have the ability to rest on Him, and we are rest assured that He is fighting our battles for us, and that is the goodness of God, and we see it in the life of the Israelites. Although they lack faith, although they have disbelief, and even myself sometimes, we all lack faith and we all have disbelief, but yet He provided for them. Yet He brought them bread. Yet He brought them water from the rock. And even in seeing all these miracles, they still doubted, but we can see He still guarded them. He still led the way. He still cared after them. And, and that is... And that is what the gospel is. And so often we are, we are afraid to surrender conditionally. I mean, like we all half-heartedly surrender because we're scared God is going to take something away. And that is when the focus is on us. But when we come and we unconditionally surrender, it's not about God taking something away. No, it is about the invitation which he gives to us to have eternal life and to live with him. And this is the invitation to the life of Jesus, all right, to have life in the fullness. Christianity isn't that, Christianity isn't, it doesn't mean that if you love me, if we, call, we can't call the Lord our Savior, but not our Lord. We can't say he's our Savior, but we are disobedient. What Christianity says is that if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you will unconditionally surrender because we will see the heart of God and we will see the fullness of God in our lives. And we don't surrender because of the goodness of God. No, we surrender because of our love for Jesus and the relationship with Jesus. And so often when we come and we surrender unconditionally, that is when we give our hearts over. And that is when the Spirit of God comes within us and it begins to guide us like He guided the Israelites. And when the Spirit of, of God begins to guide us, we become, we become transformed effortlessly. Things in our life happen, in our hearts happen effortlessly. Because why? Because the Spirit is working in us and through us. And when we live in the, when we live the life of Jesus and we choose Jesus, we aren't the light. We are living the life. We are living in Christ, and it is His light that we are living in. So often we're focusing on, on, on our own deeds. That is what happens when we, when we surrender conditionally. When we keep few things away, we're trying to shine a light, but we're trying to shine our own light. That we know that. Jesus is the life and he is the light. So when we're living in Jesus, we have the light shining on us and we are just reflecting his light. And with the story of the Israelites, it is all for his glory. Amen. So God is with us in the wilderness when we lack faith and when we have doubt. But we know that the goodness of God 
is always there. His goodness of God, because God is love, and that is who God is. Even in our, in, our, in our mistakes, in our failures, in our lack of faith, His goodness follows us, and He goes before us. And this evening, I really want to hit home these two points. It says, we need to surrender unconditionally. All right? God's not going to take something away when we're surrendering partially. We might, we might lose something, but we are missing the invitation to live with Christ, to live the life of Christ, and to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And that is where we're going to find pure joy. That is where we're going to find, we're going to find joy. We're going to find peace. We're going to, we're going to be able to rest with Jesus, and we're going to know He's going to fight our battles. And it is in His hands and not in our hands. Amen. So I asked JP to, to sing us a song this evening. Um, the words are on the screen. Maybe you can just read the lyrics and then you can just ask the Holy Spirit to just minister to you. If there's something that we're partially surrendering and, and we're keeping things aside, maybe we just ask the Holy Spirit to just minister to us. Amen. And I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head down, I will sing of the goodness of God. amazing to know the goodness of God is constantly running after us and that he is constantly drawing near to us and I just want to just quickly finish up with this thing the grace of God does not make our sin okay no what it does is we have also have a responsibility we've got a responsibility to surrender unconditionally to give over everything and then that comes with obedience all right so even though he does these things we as Christians what a Christian is, is to, is to be obedient, to surrender everything. And I think so often we 
forget that. We forget about the obedience and the importance of obedience and, and the role which obedience plays. Because through obedience, we, we, we come closer to Jesus. And, and we don't do it just because we want to be close to Jesus. No, we do it because our love for Jesus and the work of the Spirit in us. So the two things, remember this week, right, each day we can wake up with, with thankfulness. Even though things are, are seeming maybe, maybe down and things are seeming gloom at the moment, we can look back and we can see the goodness of God in our lives. Maybe this, this week just reflect a bit and, and go look at how thankful we can actually be. And not to forget that we still have a responsibility of, of surrendering unconditionally and of being obedient, of being obedient. Yes, amen. Right, so I hope you guys can take something this evening. Thank you guys for being here. And then I'm just going to close off and it will be finished. If you bow your heads. Yes, Lord, thank you that we can be here, Lord. Thank you that your goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives. Yes, Lord, we just pray this week that you will be with us, Lord, that we can, that we will, will be just aware of your presence and aware of you in our lives, Lord. We just come and we come and we just wholeheartedly, we just come and surrender unconditionally again, Lord. And we pray that you will just come and you will guide us like with the Israelites and how you still guide us today. That we can just be your servants all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You guys have a lovely week.